We will begin chapter five by asking the question, why do you think we study primates? Obviously, we are primates. And so one way we can study primates is through the process of homology, which is the correct answer here, letter B. Um, and this is when we look at traits that are similar because of common ancestry. So, uh, so that is through the comparison of uh, the term homology. So in biology, homology is the existence of shared ancestry between a pair of structures or genes in different taxa. So like I said, we are primates. So the reason gorillas and baboons are both quadrupedal is because they both descended from a quadrupedal ancestor. However, that's actually not the same analogy that we use for, or like the same understanding that we have for gorillas and chimpanzees, um, which is discussed in chapter four, if you want to go back and review that example. However, analogy is a comparison between two things, typically for the purpose of explanation or clarification. Um, so the process of how the, an analogy is basically um, understanding, you know, like bipedalism in humans and kangaroos. So bipedalism evolved separately in these two individuals because they're not genetically closely related. They don't share a common ancestor that was bipedal. So in other words, this is the evolution of a similar adaptation in unrelated species. So the term here is convergent evolution, and the next blank is bipedalism. So like I just said, similarity between traits due to convergent evolution, not common descent, is analogy. So we study primates for both looking at homologies and analogies. So while reasoning by homology often focuses on the similarities we share with other primates, reasoning by analogy looks more closely at the differences. Primates are a remarkably diverse group of mammals. They vary enormously in body size from the minute mouse lemur to the gorilla. Some live in tropical forests while others live in grasslands. Some are diurnal while others are nocturnal. There are differences in social organization and behaviors like territoriality, but the question is why? Scientists studying primates look for patterns in all of this diversity. Are differences in behavior among closely related species tied to differences in ecological conditions? Alternatively, do we see more distantly related primates that happen to occupy similar ecological niches converging on the same behavioral strategy? In other words, studying primates allows us to examine more closely how natural selection shapes behavior. Understanding these quote-unquote rules will allow us to better understand and reconstruct the adaptive pressures important during, during early human evolution. So now let's think about what characteristics primates share. So take just a minute and try to jot down as many ideas that you can come up with. Okay, so now that we've established why we study primates, the next step is to be sure that we can actually identify one. So like you just did this activity of writing down all the traits, um, whenever we're trying to classify any group of animals, one looks for the features that the group shares in common. For example, look at the five different primates in this slide. What do they all have in common? I suppose you could start with the fact that all primates have body, hair, or fur, four limbs, give birth to live young, and nurse their young with milk. However, these are all shared ancestral characteristics present in all mammals and are not useful for identifying a primate. So, we just need to find what is unique in primates and primates alone. This is a bit trickier than it sounds because there's no one unique characteristic that all primates have to the exclusion of any other mammal. I'll repeat that. There is not a single unique characteristic that all primates have to the exclusion of any other mammal. Instead, there are a group of characteristics variably present in different primate groups, and there are sometimes important exceptions. So these are the derived characteristics, which means that they appear later in the evolution of a lineage or clade, whereas ancestral traits appear earlier in the lineage or clade. So the first trait is a big toe on the foot is opposable, but this is lost in humans. 
Hands are prehensile, so they can actually grab onto things. Primates have tactile pads. They have flat nails instead of claws. Their visual sense is highly developed. Locomotion tends to be hind limb, limb dominated, um, so the center of gravity is near the back. But that's what that means. The olfactory apparatus is reduced in primates, so they have reduced sense of smell. Females tend to have small litters, and gestation and juvenile periods are longer than in other mammals of similar size. Brains are large compared to other mammals of similar size. And molars are unspecialized. There's a maximum of two incisors, one canine, three premolars, and three molars on each half of the upper and lower jaw. Okay, now let's think about some key features of primates. First of all, how does the diet of a primate impact its home range? First, we have availability of food, and then secondly, seasonality of food. What a primate eats has a strong influence on the territory it occupies, its home range, and in part, behavioral characteristics such as territoriality. We will discuss this more in a moment. However, for now, recognize that the home range of a primate is strongly influenced by the availability of food it eats and how available it is throughout the year. Leaf-eating mon leaf -eating monkeys, which are shown here for instance, tend to have smaller home ranges than fruit-eating primates. Because leaves are more plentiful than fruit, these primates do not need to travel great distance and extend their home range to find food. However, fruit-eating primates often have larger home ranges. This is particularly the case for frugivores, given that different fruit can ripen at different times of the year. Having a large home range, therefore, increases the likelihood that at least some of the menu is in season and at least part of the home range throughout the year. Ranging behavior and territoriality vary considerably in primates. Some primates, like gibbons for instance, have defined home ranges that do not overlap with the home ranges of other gibbons. Thus, the boundaries for their home ranges are the same as the boundaries for their territories, and they quite aggressively defend these territories, in part through aggression and in part through vocal duets performed by the pair-bonded male and female shown in this image. Territorial behavior is best explained as a tactic by which primates defend access to two important but sometimes limited things, access to mates and resources. So that's important to note. They are territorial because it's a primate they use to defend um, both mates and resources. In contrast to gibbons, capuchin monkeys are not as territorial and their home ranges overlap with one another as shown in this image of capuchin home ranges in the Barro, Colorado Islands, Panama. They thus do not have as strictly defined territories and when different groups of capuchin monkeys do meet one another, they may fight, avoid each other, and, or sometimes commingle. When commingling occurs, there are opportunities for males and females of different groups to breed with one another. Why would some primates be so territorial while others are not? There are costs and benefits to territorial, territoriality. The difference is that it has to do with two factors, like I said on the previous slide, access to mates and access to resources. There's a cost to being territorial. Territorial primates must remain vigilant and will occasionally engage in aggressive and sometimes quite dangerous interactions with members of rival groups. The benefit, of course, is that these primates are protecting limited resources, either access to mates or resources. When the benefit of territoriality is greater than the cost, territoriality will be favored. However, if resources are not limited, or if the cost of defending these resources outweighs the benefit, more tolerant behaviors and reduced territoriality will be favored. As we will discuss in the next lecture, much of primate behavior can be understood if one recognizes that the key to reproductive success in female prim primates is access to adequate resources to grow and raise an infant, while the key to reproductive success in male primates is access to breeding females. So why are primates so social? They are very social. And living in most, um, they live in most cases in relatively large groups, although they don't always do that. This, of course, includes humans. But why are primates so social? There are two possible explanations for this, and there are important negative consequences as well. As we already discussed, living in relatively large groups is a successful strategy to decrease predation. So that's the first one. 
The first blank is predator avoidance. It also increases the likelihood of successfully mobbing and deterring a predator attack, and if an attack should occur, it decreases the chance that you are the one that is eaten. In addition to predator avoidance, primate sociality is thought by many to also be related to feeding competition. A particularly vulnerable patch, um, so the second group or second blank is feeding competition. So a particularly valuable patch of forest with clumped high quality food items such as fruiting trees can be defended by a relatively large group of primates against others. As we'll see in the next chapter, female reproductive success is dependent on access to resources and male reproductive success is dependent on access to females. So high quality food patches are valuable and sought commodities and may encourage the formation and maintenance of large groups. However, primate sociality is not without its cost as well. Although a large number of primates may be able to defend a food patch against a rival group, they still must compete among themselves for food or for mates. Additionally, a large concentrated group increases the likelihood of disease transmission. Additionally, um, being social can increase or decrease cortisol levels, which is the stress hormone. So this link right here, I'll try to post, I'll try to remember to post it later if I didn't already, um, shows how primate sociality um, decreases stress hormones. And then there's another example from snow monkeys. However, obviously um, being uh, social comes with these types of uh, costs, such as increased competition and increased disease transmission. So those are the last blanks there. So there's five basic types of sociality. The first one is just being completely solitary, and this is when females, usually with their offspring, are separated from males. So nocturnal lorises uh, actually engage in solitary behavior, and if you look on YouTube, you can find a lot of videos on nocturnal lorises, and you can see why being solitary is probably adaptive, because they um, go out and forage at nighttime. And so if there's more lorises, this would increase the risk of predation. The second type of being social is being pair bonded. So this is when you have one male and one female and offspring. So gibbons, for example, are um, pair bonded and they have low sexual dimorphism, which means there's little difference between males and females in terms of sexual secondary sexual characteristics. They're about the same height, their body sizes are about the same. And this is something that you usually see in pair bonded species because um, they have less mate competition. And um, here I have the I have analogy, not homology, because humans are also pair bonded species, but we evolved pair bonded sociality uh, separately because other close primates or other primates that are closely related to us aren't pair bonded. The next type of sociality is multi-male, multi-female. This is when one female shares home range, a home range with males. In this case, we have marmosets and tamarins that are multi-male and with one female. Um, on the other hand, you have one male, multiple females, and gorillas and howler monkeys are a classic example of this. Usually males are a lot larger than females in this case, and it's because of the sexual dimorphism. And um, here, males often have to compete vigorously for access to females. Finally, we have multi-male, multi-female groups. And this is, for example, baboons are multi-male, multi-female, chimpanzees and bonobos are multi-male, multi-female. Um, however, chimpanzees and bonobos, like we learned, engage in a fission-fusion grouping system where males, or not males, but everyone will band together when there's a lot of access to resources and then separate when those resources become scarce. Finally, we have different types of mating strategies, which kind of most, a lot of the times align with these social structures, but there are exceptions. So um, you can't necessarily make that conclusion off the bat. So first we have monogamy, which is pair bonding. So it's one male, one female. Then we have polyandry, which is multiple males and one female reproducing. Then you have polygyny, which is one male, multiple females. And then polygingandry, which is multi multiple males, multiple females. And in other words, we call this um, promiscuity is the term that we say. And we don't attach a moral value to it 
in anthropology.